Hello fun people, how are you guys doing today? If you're new around here, my name is Ashley and I'm a soil scientist. On this channel, I like to take that science and apply it to all things plants. And in today's video, we're gonna be talking about humic acid and specifically how to make a better potting soil for our indoor plants and kind of the science behind why I'm such a huge advocate of this side of house plant life. But first, if you enjoy the science behind house plants, the potting soil, the actual plants themselves, then be sure to let me know in the comments down below. Hit that subscribe button, give this video a thumbs up, and let's just get straight into it. So you guys have heard me talk about humic acid over and over and over again. And the reason why I'm beating this to death is because it is I think it's going to be the new thing for both gardening and for indoor plants. And it's because it works. The whatever's going on with it, it's definitely working. Now, my first video on this, I got into more so the ethics side of humic acid and different ways of which it's derived and how it can become problematic. And then I also go into how they label it as humic and fluvic acid, but in a lot of cases, we really don't know what humic or fluvic acid is or how to replicate it. And we think we're replicating it, but we're not entirely sure. Nonetheless, the byproduct that we end up with that is humic acid is wonderful and it works very, very well. I'm using it currently outdoors and I have also been using it inside with my houseplants and I'm noticing you know, pretty stellar results. So the product I use is Ketonic. It looks like this. I will leave an affiliate link for this product down below. Now this is ethically sourced uh, Canadian product, um, also available in the United States to purchase. And this is what the bottle looks like. There's also a bottle that is smaller than this. A little bit goes a very, very long ways. And the way that I actually apply this to my soil is with a milk jug. <laughs> So I know this sounds weird, but I, I water all my plants with milk jugs. So I fill my milk jugs up. I let them get to room temperature or warmer. I like sun warmed water for both my indoor plants and my outdoor plants, oddly enough, because um, I do find I get better results for my plants in general. So warm, but like sun warmed water with my dosage of ketonic for this size of jug. And then I water every time with my ketonic. You cannot over water with ketonic because it is not a inorganic compound, meaning it does not have salt in it. However, it is also not a fertilizer in and of itself. So you do have to still supplement with fertilizer. Now, the beauty of a humic acid is that it is kind of like compost on steroids. Therefore, you can use both organic or inorganic forms of fertilizer and get very similar results. So the reason why I say that is because in the houseplant community, it is not uncommon for us to use things like vera compost, compost manures within our potting soil. There's nothing wrong with this. The issue comes when we are so obsessed with sterilizing our soil because we want to get rid of things like fungus gnats, mealy bugs, mold. Some people just do not like mold root rot, whatever the case is. So we always see on forums, on online discussions about how to sterilize our soil, either with chemicals, neem oil, or in the oven. And I beg of you, please do not do this. You are actually altering that potting soil medium. Now, while potting soil is soilless, it actually has a even greater effect when it is cooked or baked, meaning a soil when cooked or baked because it is inorganic, it really doesn't alter its physical or chemical properties that much. It just kind of dehydrates it and would dehydrate any microbes, big and small, harmful or beneficial within the soil profile. When we bake a potting soil medium, which is typically coconut coir, peat moss, we actually alter the structure. So I want you to think of it as a hair. Um, so our actual head of hair, we always see the Pantene Pro-V commercials where we see the strand of hair and it's all, all the platelets are nicely laid down and then it comes along, dries out and then it uh, fluffs up. So what actually happens is the opposite when it comes to potting soil. When we bake or we sterilize our potting soil, our potting soil goes 
dead flat and it makes it really difficult to actually re-wet or um, help water penetrate back into that system because we actually need those nooks and crannies that are developed through hydration. So we actually need a plumping effect on our soilless medium. So that is why we don't want to sterilize it because it actually makes it kind of hydrophobic. And I'm sure you've seen this before. If you've had a severely dried out bag of potting soil, compost, manure, vera compost, whatever the case is, you notice that it's hydrophobic. And the hydrophobicity of this is due to the actual laying down of the fibers of the organic fibers not allowing the water to penetrate so if you want to google what that concept is or if you want a video on that concept then let me know in the comments down below but essentially it is called uh, water repellency or um, soil repellency there's multiple different names of it many different studies done on the concept because of how difficult it actually is to re-wet soil that has come into that level of dehydration the other issue with the sterilization is that yes we're getting rid of those harmful microbes that we do not want because they cause root rot or they cause fungus on the top of the soil which looks ugly however we are also getting rid of all the beneficial microbes meaning the microbes such as nematodes that will eat uh, mealybug eggs thrip egg fungus gnat eggs Watch my, my nematode video if you want more on that. And then we also will end up um, getting rid of our nitrifying, denitrifying bacteria, phosphate solubilizing bacteria, you name it, it is all gone. Meaning if we are using an inorganic form of fertilizer in our soil, it is just amplified and it gets that much worse because we don't have the microbes to actually follow through on our nutrient cycles to make that nutrient into a bioavailable form. So when we notice on organic packages, we right away can see that the values of NPK are much, much lower than that of an inorganic substitute. The reason for this is because the inorganic substitute is immediately bioavailable, meaning the moment it hits the soil and water is applied, it can be brought up into the plant because it is already in a usable form. We don't need the microbes present in many cases in order to alter that format or make it into a format that is uptaken by the plant. However, in an organic soil, we do need those components present. And in a potting soil system or an indoor plant system, a closed system, this is even more important because we actually want a very biodiverse soil profile because it's going to help us enormously fight off things like root rot, which is actually caused by an anaerobic bacteria. It's going to help with full mungus and full mold that is harmful and then also help with controlling of pests that can be damaging to the upper foliage of the plant so we want biodiversity to the max so the next question is how do we get biodiversity in a closed system such as a container which is what we have in a lot of cases with our potting soil or with our house plants the answer to this is we need to add carbon and we need to add organic amendments in a diverse range and that is where something like the humic acid would come into play so the humic acid is going to add the carbon contents it's also going to add a diverse array of amino acids carbohydrates proteins you name it it's in there and this isn't feeding the plant so much as it's feeding the actual soil itself and not so much the inorganic compounds of the soil, but the living things within the soil that are going to eventually help you fight off things like root rot or harmful mold and fungus and feed, you know, things that eat your mealybugs, that sort of thing. So that is where a humic acid would come in. And this is why you would apply it you know, every time you water. That brings me into the second way that we keep the biological uh, profile up in our potting soil for our house plants, and that is through moisture. Now, you do not want anaerobic soil, you want moist soil. There is a huge difference here. Anaerobic means that oxygen is absent. If you are running into a situation where you water on a regular basis and you end up with anaerobic soil, your soil is much too heavy and you don't have enough air space in it. This is why you would add in things like pumice, perlite, volcanic rock, orchid bark, that sort of thing to add in enough air. The key here is that we don't want 
so much airiness in the system that we are losing microbial activity due to lack of moisture because we're not able to get into water nearly enough. So find your comfort zone. A lot of people are promoting an aeroid mix, which is uh, pumice, charcoal. It's almost basically like the old school orchid mixes. That is okay, so long as we're able to keep up with the watering system. Also keep in mind, because you are so top heavy on actual wood and tree fiber, it's not uncommon for you to end up with more fruiting bodies or fungal bodies within the profile if you are adding in things like humic acid and keeping the moisture nice and high. This is okay, this is normal. It's a normal process in the breakdown or the degradation of that potting soil medium. So watch my mold video so you can get a better understanding of how this is beneficial to the actual potting soil itself. It means your potting soil is alive and that means you're actually doing a good job and you're not doing a bad job. So keep that in mind. Now if you're on the other side of the spectrum where you have very very high peat and you're adding things like ketonic and um, humic acid and moisture and it goes anaerobic, this is going to do nothing for you because the beneficial microbes that actually fight off root rot don't survive in anaerobic environments, meaning you need to add in what you need to add in in order to counteract that appropriately. Appropriately, Now that may be things like pumice, uh, bark, orchid bark, whatever the case is, have a whole uh, DIY potting soil recipe over on their website that you can actually check out. And it literally goes through every type of plant and your watering style, whether or not it has lighting, your potting style, because the potting, actual pot itself, is a part of the medium. Trust me, it's very, very thorough. The third thing you want to do besides the humic acid and the moisture is a limit the exposure of the pot to high heat, whether this be in the form of sun or ambient heat. So the actual heat inside of a closed system can kill off our microbes that are typically used to living and surviving in an environment that is in the ground and is not exposed to high heat. Makes sense, pretty basic stuff. Now in an indoor scenario, it's very unlikely that we're going to run into this. However, in an outdoor scenario, it can happen. Keep in mind in an indoor setting, when we have high heats applied to our actual pot, that would take place probably more so inside of something such as a grow tent. So if you are a grow tent person or you have a rehab tent, then make sure your actual soil itself is not getting too warm. The last way to actually increase the microbial activity and therefore the nutrient cycling and the ability to fight off disease, and I mean, the list goes on and on, is to actually mulch the top of the soil. Now, this one is going to be for the experts, not so much the beginner and or plant people. Because we are drastically reducing our rates of evapotranspiration in a system that has a mulch on top, it's really going to alter our watering habits and how we go about watering in and of itself. This may not be for everybody, especially if you're in an environment that has a very high ambient moisture this simply just will not work. However, if you are in a dry climate with very low rates of evapotranspiration or with, or with very high rates of evapotranspiration, then you may benefit from using a mulch on top. So this would be more applicable to people in the southern states, people growing under actual grow lamps, people growing in terracotta pots, or growing inside of undersized pots. And this mulch can come in the form of actual rocks, physical wood chips, grass cuttings, straw, you name it. And this is simply going to help keep the moisture higher within the soil system. A bonus tip that may not be for everybody is actually putting your roots or your planted pots into a clear pot. Now, it's really difficult to find clear pots um, that are going to fit into beautiful cover pots. I understand that, but if you can get your hands on it, please do. Orchid companies or orchid uh, pots typically are the best way to get these. And not only is it going to give you a visual look at the roots itself, but it's actually going to allow for sun penetration into that soil system. So if you guys did not know, the microbes in the soil, both outdoors in the natural environment and indoors inside of containers, 
only exist in the portion of the soil that is exposed to light. So a lot of microbes still need sunlight to some degree, and therefore the active section of the actual soil system is within that first you know, foot to two feet of actual soil uh, matter. So if you have a clear pot inside of a cover pot, you're obviously going to end up with more sun exposure, especially if that cover pot is oversized compared to the nursery pot it's in. And you will begin to see things such as algae formation on the sides of the container. And this again is a very good thing. A sign of a healthy soil is a soil that has upwards of 5% algae. The higher, the better. It actually increases oxygen inheritation to the soil system, which is going to then reduce the level of root rot and anaerobic disease that you can actually end up within your plants. So that's just another fun fact that is actually something that I personally use as a way to detect root rot very early on is with the clear pot system. And then I also end up with the algae and better microbial activity and therefore better transfer of nutrients, especially in an in, in an organic indoor system. Um, and yeah, I'm just, I'm all about doing organic indoor because I do find it really does keep the pests down and it's just much easier to manage. So that is just my personal opinion in that sense. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, be sure to give it a thumbs up, hit that subscribe button and let me know in the comments down below if you learned something new and what that new thing was. I will talk to you guys next time. Bye.